without further ado, we have uh, uh, Schneider here talking about uh, GR Iridium. So please give him a warm welcome. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, this talk will be about GR Iridium, our GNU radio out of tree toolkit to receive stuff from Iridium. Um, and just maybe quickly about me. So I'm from Munich um, with the CCC there for now over 10 years. have done first blinky things and then more um, electronic embedded stuff. The badges for the camps was involved there. And around four years ago, started to look together with SEC, also someone from the Munich CCC, into Iridium. Um, this talk will be, as mentioned, mainly about the out-of-tree module, so it will be rather technical and more about the signal processing part and how to effectively do this on a um, not that modern machine anymore. If you're interested in how does Iridium work, what kind of data can you see there, um, how to use the tools and everything, I suggest looking at these two talks, we, especially the last one um, from the 11th Hope, gives a good overview over the whole tool chain because the tool chain doesn't ex consist out of, uh, on, doesn't only cons consist out of GR Iridium, there's also the Iridium toolkit written in Python, which is mainly there to make sense of the received data. So um, quick introduction to Iridium. It has been up there for now almost 20 years. Um, I guess a few satellites are up 20 years already. It provides a number of different services, data, voice, SMS, pagers, um, short burst data, which is more for machine to machine communication and <laughs> lots of things. Um, you couldn't even count all of them, at, at least I can't. It has 66 logical satellites, um, especially the older satellites, they sometimes uh, teamed them up. So you'd have two satellites moving along close to each other and both of them slightly defective, but <laughs> if you put them together, they uh, make up for that, and then you have like still one satellite. It looks like one satellite to the receivers. Um, they are at the moment in the process of replacing all of these satellites um, with the Iridium Next satellites, because these have reached the end of their lifetime, and so Iridium is there to stay, and still probably for many years to come, an interesting thing to look at. Gareth uh, <laughs> just uh, was on the amp hour talking about using uh, Iridium for tracking uh, tuna fishing buoys. And he mentioned that, yes, so when they were thinking about security for Iridium, they just said, okay, it's just going to be very, very difficult to do because there's a huge Doppler shift and it's so complex and only, yeah, the most determined adversaries will be able to do this. And yes, uh, I mean, we were determined. <laughs> and <laughs> it, it took us roughly half a year to get from we have no idea about anything to we can at least decode something. And from that point on, together with the help also from the Osmocom people, which do open source mobile communication in Germany, um, it went pretty quickly from decoding one-way pages to decoding voice calls. And uh, though that's all super interesting, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the signal processing here. So we're talking about SDRs here, Software Defined Radio, and just to lay down a few terms here, um, the most basic piece of information you can have there is a sample. And a sample is in the world of SDRs made out of two numbers the in-phase and the quadrature component, and we'll get to talk about that in a second. But it's like the single piece of information, and your SDR gives you a few millions of these per second. And we would call that the stream. So a stream is a number of samples coming in one after each other over time, and that's what your algorithm is looking at. A burst is just an increase in energy in this stream. It just says, okay, Something just came in, there's something going on, we don't know exactly what yet, but um, we might want to look at this. And in, in this picture over here, 
um, frequency is on the x-axis and energy is on the y-axis, you can see these peaks here. And each of these peaks over time is a burst. So it goes up and down and up and down. And when energy goes up, we have a burst. These bursts contain symbols. A symbol is the smallest entity of like actual data which can be in there. And if you assemble multiple symbols together, you get a frame. So not every burst contains symbols. It might just be noise, but bursts coming from Iridium satellite will contain symbols. Um, so this thing down here is an example of an Iridium frame, as it looks like in the waterfall. Um, it's just over time, how does this image evolve? And you just have a, um, a preamble with some static content and then the actual data. And if you throw this into our tool chain, you get this thing with just zeros and ones coming out of it, and that's uh, where the out of 3 module stops. And if you put that into the Iridium toolkit, it will decode stuff and will tell you, okay, this is from following satellite and it contains, I'm not sure, pager messages or um, uh, ring alerts for a certain device. Iridium uses just slightly over 10 megahertz of bandwidth. It starts at exactly 1.616 gigahertz. Then you have 10 megahertz of uh, duplex channels. This is where the actual voice data is and um, where most of the stuff happens. In these 10 megahertz, you get 240 channels. And above this, you get some special channels, um, specifically the ring alert and the pager channel, which have higher power. They are there to even reach into buildings and, you know, at least ring a phone or deliver a one-way pager message to a pager which is maybe sitting behind a glass window. Um, we originally started look, just looking at the pager channel. This is what we were interested in because you have these passive devices. They just receive something and we were wondering who would use that. And yeah, I mean, you can, you can guess, I guess. So, um, and this is what it then looks like. You have, um, this is the animation. Um, every time this goes up, there's a burst, and you get hundreds of bursts per second, maybe a thousand of bursts per second. And uh, this is then starting to demand a little bit of uh, computing power. So here we zoom in a little bit, and you can see there's channels here, and we get data from two different satellites right now, and you can see that the, um, the red line, which just stays up if there's a burst, it's, it's wider than a single burst. And what you can see here is the effect of the Doppler shift. So the satellites start to come towards you, then they're just on top, basically, and then they leave you again. And what this produces is a Doppler shift. So this is the frequency a single satellite produces on this channel. And first it's high and it starts to get lower and lower and lower and then tapers out over here. And when it's just above you, it, the rate of change is the highest. Um, a big of an issue, bit of an issue here is that the Doppler shift is larger than a single channel. So you cannot just by looking at a frequency say, okay, this is this channel or this is that channel because they overlap. And this is actually what they were talking about in this slide. So the Doppler shift makes it all so difficult because, you, you know, you have to track all of this stuff. Um, but we simply decided to, let's, we'll just brute force it, basically. Every time something comes in, we'll just to decode it, no matter in which channel it is, and we'll just look at it afterwards. So that's the beauty of SDR. Um, you don't have to limit yourself to these specific filters or um, a certain you know, how people thought in the beginning how you would do this, you can just throw a little bit more computing power at it and then just go around the corner. So how does an Iridium burst look like? You first have some unmodulated carrier. It's different for the uplink and the downlink. And then a unique section which identifies this as a, an Iridium frame. Every Iridium frame contains this section. So if you find it in a burst, you can be sure this is an Iridium frame. And then later on, most of the stuff here is the payload, um, which is in a um, little bit higher um, range of modulation. And now we'll get to a quick primer about IQ signals. So I mentioned that 
SDRs give you samples and they have an I and a Q component, an in-phase and a quadrature component. And usually you would draw them on a, um, on a complex plane. So you put the Q component up here and the I component here. And every sample you get gives you a dot on this plane. Um, and to quickly give you an overview of how this then looks like, Let's see, is it this one, IQ? Hope it's visible. Okay, so we have a, um, a signal, it's at zero hertz, and with IQ signals you can have positive and negative frequencies. Um, there is no special magic about that, it's just that you maybe tune somewhere in your frequency band, let's say at 1.626 gigahertz, and you grab 10 megahertz of it, then you get minus five to plus five megahertz in your spectrum that you get out of there. And this dot right here is our signal right now. It's on the complex plane, it doesn't move, but if I give it a little bit of a frequency, positive frequency in this case, you can see it, it starts moving counterclockwise. So constant movement means <coughs> frequency. And I can also go around and uh, get it to stop again, basically, and just change its angle using this slider. So here I can just drag it around on the plane, and that's just a phase offset. So if you have phase shift keying, what will happen is that this dot just jumps around in the plane. And every time you get a, a new symbol, it might just get a little bit of a phase offset, and then it jumps from one place to another place. Um, and if you add a second signal to this, because this is just a single frequency, what you get is that it's just superimposed. So now um, I've added a little bit weaker signal with a higher frequency, and it will just rotate around the already rotating point. It's like a, uh, you can, almost like planets and moons rotating around each other. <coughs> so, a, a fixed rotation somewhere here is a phase shift. If it keeps rotating, you have a frequency shift. And the distance from the origin here is the amplitude. So, the further away from the origin, the more energy your signal has. And sometimes you also see plots like these. So we have a um, red line and a blue line here. One of them is I, one of them is Q. And they always come in pairs, and every sample here gives you one of these pairs. And over time, you can then see how the signal evolves. Okay. So an iridium burst in this view will look like just constant energy on both channels. Then you get the unique word, which identifies the frame. And here, the blue and the red signal, I and Q, they go together. They stay on top of each other, and you only have high and low. And this is the unique word, and over here in the payload, you can see they start to diverge from each other. So sometimes you have the red one on top and the blue one on the bottom, or the other way around. And this means here, every symbol can encode four different states, or two bits. And over here, every symbol can only encode two different states, or one bit. So this is binary shift keying and this is quadrature shift keying. So how does the whole thing work? Um, you see in the animation where the peaks went up and down. And if you just you know, flatten that out basically, and up here is um, the beginning and over time it evolves in this direction. Here you have the frequency and the brighter it gets, the more energy you have. This is called a waterfall. And the first thing you do is you run an FFT, which gives you basically this picture for the, for the algorithm, and you just pick out some region where there's energy. And let's say we want to have a look at this, this thing over here. This is the signal we're interested in. And what we do is we just detect the energy. We cut out a little bit of our signal. Um, we leave a little bit um, of noise in front, and we leave a little bit of stuff behind so we are sure that everything is inside it and we just mark the frequency where this burst happens. Then what you do is you rotate the whole thing. So everything which was on the left over there just rotated in on the right 
And the signal which was over here, we've just moved over here into roughly the middle of our spectrum. This makes it easier for the algorithms to work with the signal. Almost all signal processing algorithms which uh, operate on these signals expect the signal to be roughly centered at zero hertz. This is where they want it. And this is the first step to just roughly get it there. Next step is we put a filter around it, so we throw away everything which is on the sides, and then we actually also reduce the amount of data which we are processing by just taking every tenth sample, for example. This gives you just the information in the middle and you can throw out the rest, which makes it easier to handle all the data which is coming in, because we're still talking about like a thousand bursts per second here. Then it gets easier to look at the signal and you just have a look at, okay, where does the energy actually start? You cut away everything above it. And then the nice part about an iridium signal is this unmod unmodulated part up here, which makes it pretty easy to say, okay, we'll just take a very fine frequency estimation of, over this thing and this will give us a much better estimate of where is this uh, the signal um, located where is zero hertz because you can see that over here the I and Q components they form these uh, sinusoidal waves which is an indication that it's still rotating a little bit in the plane and after moving it exactly in the middle you see there's no change anymore in the I and Q part they're not on top of each other but at least they're not rotating anymore they're somewhere in the plane now so what do we do we rotate the whole thing so that these two two components are on top of each other. And then you can start to see, okay, over here is our unique word. We can correlate against that thing. We know how it should look like, and we just basically run an algorithm which looks for this pattern. And as soon as it finds this pattern, it produces a peak and says, exactly at this sample, this pattern appears. And now we have everything we need. We, have, we know exactly where does our signal start? We have rotated it nicely so that we can directly look at each single um, symbol there and decide is the blue one on top and the red one on the bottom and then it's a zero one or the other way around and get to a stream of bits. That's all we wanted. So looks nice in the pictures and in theory, but how do you make a computer do this? Well, that was a lot of work, and back at the 32C3, we had something implemented in Python. So it, we prototyped all of this stuff in Python. It took us roughly, I guess, one and a half years or something like that. And what we had done was, so the SDR comes in, you put everything into the FFT, there's a burst detector which just looks for the energy, and then uh, I mentioned you look for the energy and then you cut something out of the signal. These cuts were put into a queue, but every single one of these cuts was roughly one megabyte of data. So you get uh, a whole lot of, uh, of potential iridium frames in here, and then it fans out into a, uh, a chain of filters and decimators, the down mixer who was just doing, you know, shifting it over and removing all of the excess data, finding the start and everything, and then just demodulating the, the data at the very end. So we were, doing to do, we were able to do about two megahertz of spectrum using this, and not the 10 megahertz that Iridium actually uses. Um, so I sat down and thought, okay, Probably it's a good idea to re-implement this in C++ and GNU Radio. Because while Python is really nice to prototype things, it's, and it's still not the fastest thing to work with, even with NumPy. And also what's very nice about GNU Radio is the eco ecosystem. So you get things like the Osmocom source. While in this picture, the SDR is actually um, plugged into this thing via a Unix pipe and it's an RTL SDR pipe, Python script. GNU Radio offers you real integration with good SDRs, which also can do more. So it was a pretty easy decision to, to go for it. 
Though the thing is that GNU Radio, it doesn't really want to work with the stuff we are working with. It wants to work with constant streams of things. It, um, it comes from a world where you have an analog stream of voice or TV signals or something like that. And it just goes on and on and on. Though Iridium bursts, they change in frequency. They're there, they're not there, and you don't want to run 240 decoders all the time. Especially also with the Doppler shift. So this wasn't that easy. Also, the blocks which decode stuff actually want to have some data, they want to synchronize on it, and then they might throw the stuff away. But from that point on, they can fairly easily decode the rest. Though that doesn't work for us either, because every burst you have to basically decode from the beginning and you cannot throw away data. Then people who have worked with GNU Radio Companion might know that you have to click a lot. And if you want to, um, let's say, do the brute force with the 240 channels, you have to click 240 things. That's not ideal, so you actually want to build the flow graph, which uh, GNU Radio is made out of programmatically and not in GNU Radio. And in general, it's very high effort. So I would still recommend to not do such a project uh, in GNU Radio to begin with, like when you start out, but do prototypes in Python and then only when you know what you actually want to do, do it in GNU Radio. No, GNU Radio has nice things also. Um, I mentioned the stream. And it's made out of samples, and, but you can add metadata to each sample. They, they call it tags. And this might actually be nice, to, let's say, to say, okay, here something starts, or it's actually at this frequency. And you can you know, build blocks which do stuff and, and have a bit of, a, um, bit of intelligence in there. And then a stream comes out of it, still a constant stream, but at least it contains some information about what's going on in the stream. And then it also has the concept of PDUs. And a PDU is not a stream anymore. It's more packet-based. It can be arbitrary data in there. But usually you would put in a block of samples and then the metadata describing what's in this sample. And very important also that is that GNU Radio gives you access to lots of digital signal processing algorithms which are pretty fast. Especially the Falk library, which directly helps you to optimize things because it looks at your architecture of your machine and it chooses the, the optimal algorithm for your machine. So it might use some AVX instructions here and um, just the MMX instructions over there, which is really nice and you don't have to think about this anymore. So after 32C3, we started to work on GRIDIUM or basically I started to port whatever we had in Python over there. And yeah, some people took it up and also wrote some nice UIs for it so you can see what's going on and make statistics for it. And it took roughly three months to, to get it working. So it was much quicker than prototyping in, in Python, but a uh, steep learning curve still. So this is a um, very basic flow graph, um, which is implemented in GRIDIUM. So you first have the FFT burst tagger. This thing looks for the peaks in the signal. It marks them. Then this block is only responsible to cut things out of the stream, produce PDUs, which go over here. This whole block does all the moving and, and decimating and filtering and looking for the stuff and all of this stuff. So it's the most complex block of all of these. And it outputs some more PDUs into the QPSK demodulator, which basically just does the, um, OK, where's the red line, where's the blue line, and outputs something on standard out. So we're going to look at these different blocks. First, the FFT burst tagger. Then, oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. OK, burst tagger. So what you do is you do an FFT. And how an FFT works is you put in, let's say, 1,024 samples. And then it tells you, OK, you gave me 1,024 samples. I'll give you on my output 1,024 frequencies. And I'll tell you how much energy is in which frequency. We build an average out of that. 
So we know roughly where is our noise floor, are there any constant transmitters in the region, because we don't want to trigger all the time onto some interference which is coming from, I'm not sure, some cell tower or something like that, which is constantly there. So we just take an average, it gives us an idea of what does our environment look like, but we also feed it into the energy detection. It just compares the instant FFT against the average, and if the instant goes above the average, we have a peak. All it does then is, okay, the sample where the peak gets detected gets tagged with roughly which frequency is it and which burst was detected. And down here we also have a block which bypasses this stuff. This is just a delay block, so this stuff looks a little bit in the future, and this is what actually then comes out of the uh, end of this thing, and it means that the burst can happen, it can rise, we detect it somewhere, and then when the delayed signal comes along over here, we can actually say, okay, roughly here was the beginning, let's tag it. What comes out of this thing, these are the only lines of code you'll see in here, uh, except uh, for the other blocks as well. We give it an ID, so the whole thing can be tracked through the whole uh, flow graph. This is good for debugging, but it also helps in sorting the stuff later on. It will tell you roughly what, what was the frequency, where's the center frequency of the signal, how strong was the burst, and at which sample rate was this taken. And if the burst is gone again, we just say, okay, this ID, which we've uh, found over here, is away, so that the next block down there, the burst tagger can say, okay, um, if the, the ID comes in, I'll start collecting samples, and if the ID goes out, I'll stop collecting samples, and I'll just publish a PDU over here. This is pretty simple. It just keeps a list of currently active bursts. And multiple bursts can be active at the same time on different frequencies. So you have a, a list of bursts, multiple ones which are active at the same time. And when one of them goes out, it just spits out a PDU over here down to the burst down mix. So it keeps the ID and basically all of the other stuff. The only thing it inserts is an offset, and the offset is basically a timestamp. How many samples into the stream is this PDU old? The burst down mix now is the more complex thing. Um, you do a CFO, that's the center frequency offset estimation. This is just the initial FFT. Then the decimation, finding the start, doing the fine center frequency offset. Um, we square the signal here, which means we multiply it by itself. That's useful for uplink signals. Uplink signals have a slightly different preamble, and it consists of two tones. But if you square the signal, out comes a single tone. That's how the math works, and it works both for uplink as well as downlink which is uh, nice for us because we don't have to distinguish between them anymore here. You can just square it, um, rotate it a little bit more, a little bit better into the, uh, into the middle. Then we can look at is it an uplink or a downlink, and blah, 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 do all the stuff I've mentioned before, publish a burst and say, okay, I'm done with this burst. Question. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure right now. <laughs> I'd have to look at the code, but probably yes. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's a complex multiplication, right? You have these I and Q signals, you treat them as complex numbers, you just do a complex multiplication of I and Q. That's what's happening. The saying done over here is pretty important, because if I just quickly go back over here, there's a um, back channel here, it's this arrow, goes over here, because GNU Radio keeps a queue between this output and this input, and there's no limits to it. And the sender can actually not see how much is on my output, how much of this stuff has already been processed. And if you don't have a back channel, you just fill up this queue, you fill up all your RAM, and suddenly your machine freezes. <laughs> Great. So this, this port over here, which uh, goes back there, just signals, hey, I'm done. You can count that uh, one of the, out, 
the PDUs you've created on your output has been processed. And if you want to limit the number of bursts switches in this queue over here, that's the only way you can do it. So right now, for example, this produces maximum 500 outstanding bursts. Okay, what's coming out of the burst down mix then? You have um, the sample rate. It might have changed because we did some decimation. Center frequency stays the same. Direction tells you if it's an uplink or a downlink. It tells you exactly where is the first sample where the unique identifier starts. And offset is still an indication of how old or at which time this, did this uh, frame appear in the stream. The QPSK demodulator first decimates the data and it decimates it to one sample per symbol. That means, I mean, you're only interested in is the I computer, I component high and the Q component low or the other way around or are they both low, both high. You don't need many samples to do that. But for the signal processing and to look at the, at the signal as a human, it's nice to have more points in between. So while you have these, you know, you can see this thing goes down, there's lots of points and it goes up again. Actually, these points here in the middle or these samples are not of value. They don't have any additional information. You're actually only interested in, okay, over here, here, and here, you, because you can see that there's some periodicity to it. And you only need to sample this sample, this sample, and this sample. So the first thing we do is we throw away everything else. But how do you actually figure out which one of these is now, where is the right point to sample? And that um, was told to us by this uh, unique word start thingy that comes out of the burst down mix. It tells us exactly which sample is it that we should start with. And then you know exactly, okay, it starts over here, and we know exactly our sample rate, so we you know, want this, 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 and this sample. Everything else we can throw away. Then we remove any remaining frequency offset. And here I have to say that most of the stuff we do here, you could do quite differently. Um, it's just the easiest way we came up with to do it, and... Um, a real receiver wouldn't do it like that. And I'll quickly talk at the end what a real receiver wouldn't do here. So we remove the frequency offset. And I mentioned that the samples you can draw on a complex plane and a perfect QPSK signal would just do this. It just wanders around on these four points and we've decimated it already to one sample per symbol. So we just look at each one of them after each other and you can say, okay, um, so it starts with 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. Fine, everything perfect. But if there's a frequency offset, what's happening is this. Your point starts to rotate. It doesn't reach this point anymore perfectly, but it rotates a little bit on the, on the circle. And every time there's a sample, it rotates a little bit more. Up until the point where it actually wanders from this quadrant over to this quadrant, and now your decoder will probably say, this is not a 1-1 one, one anymore, this is a 0-1, and everything you do will be skewed from that point on. But there's a pretty easy way to rectify that. You just take, you look at your, your sample and you say, okay, it's over here, but it's in this quadrant, so I'll just note that this was around 20 degrees off, and just remember that. And the next time a symbol comes in, which is the red one over here, I, I know already I have to rotate it by roughly 20 degrees. You get the yellow symbol. And then you look again at which quadrant is it. Okay, it's this quadrant. I now know by looking at the distance of these two, it's 40 degrees off. And you do this over and over. So in the end, you, you get a signal which has been corrected in terms of frequency. You get perfect symbols. They're always at the right 45 degree angle. Next thing is to demodulate the D in the D QPSK that Iridium sends. So, so far we've always talked about QPSK, but Iridium actually sends differential QPSK. And uh, what does this mean? 
it's actually the transition from one point to another point which conveys the information. So if this point goes over here, it's a zero, 01. If it goes over here, it's a 1, 0. And the nice thing about this is that if, even if you rotate the whole thing, let's say by 90 degrees, if it goes over here, it's still a zero, 01. If it goes over here, it's still a 1, 0. This is useful if you don't actually know which way it's oriented right now. Um, we, in our flow graph, don't need to do it, actually, because we rotate everything already in the burst-down mixer. But a real receiver actually doesn't have to do the frequency offset removal. It just has to look at how is this thing jumping around. It doesn't need to do the first step there, but for whatever reason, we decided to... Um, remove the frequency offset and demodulate the DQSP just in a, in, on a bit level, basically. It has the advantage that if you look at a, a signal which passes between these two blocks, it's easy to say with your um, pure eyes that, okay, this is an iridium signal, I know what it's doing. Um, that's the only reason why I did it this way. So what comes out of this thing? It converts the offset into an actual timestamp in milliseconds. You get the center frequency again, the ID which came out of this stuff. It gives you a confidence, and the confidence is directly based on this stuff. So if the, if the received symbols straight too far away from the ideal position, we lower the confidence. And you can usually see that with signals which aren't that strong anymore, that the confidence goes down. We... Um, give it a percentage, and a 100% confidence tells you that the symbol was always very close to the ideal position, and when the confidence goes down, you know, there was lots of noise on there, and it didn't work that well anymore. Now, the um, flow graph you saw before basically looks like this. You have the source, you have the burst tagger, you have the burst to PDU, then there's the internal GNU radio Q, burst down mixer, QPSK, QPSK DMOD, and while GNU Radio gives every single block of these its own thread, this flow graph will only give you roughly um, two cores, uh, will max out roughly two cores on your machine. Because mainly the burst down mix over here will limit everything. It's the most complex block. And it will just take one core, will constantly spin, and the rest does nothing. So we fought back to our Python toolchain. How, do we, how did we do it there? Yeah, well, you just have multiple burst down mix and the queue before it stays the same and they can all share the same QPSK D mod. This works, but the problem is that at this point over here, you get enormous amounts of data because the FFT burst tagger, every time there's a burst and there can be multiple bursts at the same time, issues some... Um, some PDU, and you easily get over 10 gigabits per second of data just flowing between your cores now. And I believe that was slowing down everything here. But GNU Radio has a nice component. It's the Polyphase Channelizer, which will help us here a lot. And that was also one of the reasons uh, we chose GNU Radio, because to make use of this component. I'll give you a quick demo of what this thing does. It's a very cheap way, in terms of computational effort, to split a single stream into multiple streams. So down here I have a signal at zero hertz, and up there there's three different um, channels, which are the output of the filter bank. And if I move the signal, it moves from one of these outputs to another output. And you can see that each of these outputs has now one third of the width of the original input signal, which makes it very nice as it allows us to put all of the stuff on each of these outputs, but each output has a lower sample rate. There's less data. So if you take a one millisecond span of samples over here, you have just one-fifth of the data on a one millisecond sample uh, 
span of samples over here, which lowers a lot the, the data rate between the different cores. Though a bit of a problem is that the, this filter bank, it has very sharp edges. We know, though, that the Doppler shift can just fall between different channels. So if you have sharp edges on these channels, you might have a signal or a burst which falls between two channels and it will get lost because one part of it is in one channel and the other part is in the other channel. So what do you do? Um, the nice thing is here you can have an overlap. You can design these two filters in a way that or these two channels that um, so same thing again. At a signal, if I move it over here, oh, oh wait, it's this thing. It starts. Uh, I moved the wrong slider. No, the parameter is wrong. Okay, it's this thing. So if I move this the signal around, you can see in the middle in the stream it it moves to the left as usual, but here it starts to appear already over here. And if you imagine that this thing was a little bit wider, a few kilohertz wide, it's already in the reach of this channel and about to go out on this channel. And this is how we can decode stuff which has a Doppler shift. It will just potentially decode on multiple channels, but it will for sure decode. And later on we just throw away the duplicates. I'm not going to go about the design of these things because we probably don't have time for that. But this is how it looks now. Um, we have the FFT burst tag and then it goes directly in the polyphase channelizer and which outputs a number of streams, all of them having slightly lower sample rates. And now we only are around at three gigabits per second between these two blocks. And this now allows us to on a single core, sorry, four core machine from 2010, decode the whole band. So we feed it with a um, 10 megahertz wide signal, and it produces uh, in its peak up to 1,000 to 2,000 actual iridium frames and 20 to 25 millions per day. This is what we see in Munich. I could imagine that in a more busy area, let's say a harbor or close to the coast, you would see more, depending on what's going on. It's pretty much exactly um, making use of the four cores and still sometimes overflows, but very seldomly, at least for us in Munich, so good enough for us and anyone who wants to have a bit more performance can just uh, buy now, buy more cores, right? So that's fine. <laughs> um, Looking into the future, um, this approach will have its drawbacks. Iridium Next will have new modulation types. Uh, there's a few FCC documents which, which describe that, and they are talking about up to 240 kilosymbols per second. So right now we are over here, oh, wait. we are at 25 kilosymbols per second. That is what Iridium on a single channel at the moment. And they're talking about roughly um, times 10 over here. And a bit of an issue is that our current tool chain, it does not track the connections. So it just assumes everything which comes down and is a burst is at 25 kilosymbols per second, <coughs> or kilosymbols per second, and tries it. And if it doesn't work, it didn't work. If it worked, it's fine. But Iridium Next will have new modulations, and the current tool chain will not know how to deal with them nor will it know that a specific traffic channel, maybe from some satellite, actually is on this new modulation. We'll have to see. It's not live yet. I haven't seen any Iridium Next frame on the air yet, but the moment at least they will um, be in the air in Munich, we'll, we'll start to have a look at that. Um, what else? So, you can spend an enormous amount of time on this stuff, also the hardware layers. Um, there's dozens of services on Iridium. And we had a look at voice, data, pages, SMS, uh, the GSM layer there, 
but there's still lots of stuff we don't know about. And we have no intention of looking at this stuff anymore because it's just like, you know, one more service, one more niche thing that Iridium supports. Though there's one thing, and that's Iridium Burst, which is going to, oh, I think it's active, I'm not 100% sure. It's a one-way communication channel again, where you might have a burst which is global, where you can say from your web browser or somewhere, I want to send down this signal across the whole planet, and every receiver which is authorized to receive it should receive it and you know, do something or display something. They call it Iridium Burst. <laughs> they, um, in fact, over here say, only authorized devices belonging to the specified recipient group can unscramble the transmission. Unscramble, so I don't read decrypt or anything like that here. <laughs> I'd, I'd really love to get my hands on an Iridium Burst device and see what it does. So if anyone you know, works in the field and um, has access to this stuff or can make a recording, we would be very interested. The application, like whoever uses this stuff must have very interesting applications, I'm sure. <laughs> All right, and then maybe just something which, uh, I gave this talk already once in Germany, and someone mentioned, hey, why don't you, you know, you could do these polyphase filter banks with just a lot of channels and maybe have one per satellite and just track the satellite. Um, we're not doing this here, but it would be certainly a possibility. Uh, we're not tracking any kind of Doppler shift here. Like we, we're treating every burst equal, no matter from which satellite it's coming and which kind of Doppler shift it has. But I could imagine just a completely different layout of this thing, which is more efficient and can track multiple satellites at the same time using these polar phase filter banks, but we just didn't before. All right, so, questions? Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Over there. Okay, so the question is about basically predicting the Doppler shift. So can we use additional information, which is not what we receive from the satellites, to predict what kind of Doppler shift a satellite will have? And yes, you can do that for sure. So there is uh, NORAD tracking basically every satellite, and you get these two-line entries or TLEs which you can use together with your current location to predict how the satellite will move um, relative to you. And that's all you need to predict a Doppler shift. But for that, you need to have an internet connection and up-to-date TLEs. Um, they measure the satellites, I guess, once per day or something like that. And they quickly get outdated. Um, but it would be easy. If you just have the TLEs of all Iridium satellites, you can directly say, okay, at this point in time, the satellite will come up the horizon, it will have that Doppler shift, and just, you know, programmatically shift the Doppler shift around, absolutely. Um, though, I mean, I use this stuff every now and then, you know, in a car or, or somewhere, just, you know, plug the thing, turn it on, and then I want to have some data. I don't want to get online and get new TLEs. But absolutely, that would work. So specifically for a um, stationary receiver, that would work, yes. Anyone else? Again? Is the Iridium next to public standard? Question is if Iridium next is a public standard. So um, none of this is a public standard. Neither Iridium nor Iridium next. It's all proprietary. There, of, of course, are specifications, but they are kept within Iridium. Everything we did was based on looking at bits and trying to figure out what's going on. So 
I do not expect anything coming from the Iridium Corporation which will detail how Iridium Next actually works, except you know anything they they're forced to do. So this table is out of a rather comprehensive PDF which describes the beam patterns and the used modulations and uh, and stuff like that. But that's where it ends. It never tells you what's inside there, how long are the bursts, um, what kind of error correcting correction is used. Uh, fun fact also, the whole internet says that Iridium is using a convolutional code um, to protected stuff, I mean, in terms of error correction, but that's just plain wrong, it never does, nowhere. Maybe between satellites, but like everyone is copying this information from everyone else and everyone thinks it's true, but just isn't. <laughs> Um, which frequency is the inter-satellite communication? I'm not sure, but it's somewhere, I'm not sure, between 18 and 25 gigahertz, something like that. Yeah. The question is, do you, do you think that one day you'll get to play with devices that will do those kind of frequencies? Like what sort of, uh, hmm. how will take to so, like so can, can we, you know, listen in on that, basically, at, at which point? Um, we've never tried. It's, I, I, you know, it's not magic, right? But I'm not sure it depends also on how tight their beams are between the satellites. If you can look basically, you know, just at the horizon and, um, and catch one of these beams, I don't want to say no. Uh, it also crossed our minds, obviously, but I think it's going to be pretty tough if possible at all. Up to 10 megahertz yeah. of a 10 megahertz band. Um, and I'm wondering when you went to your C uh, implementation with the new radio, was that going to allow you to receive more? Question what? is when we went from our Python implementation, which it was already parallelized at that point, did like 2 megahertz or 2.5 megahertz of spectrum, and moved to the GR Iridium one, how much improvement was there? I don't know anymore, to be honest. Um, it's easy to try. You just set decimation to one, which means no decimation, and you get um, like the, the initial thing I showed. But yeah, I don't know anymore. I gather from that that it had enough, uh, enough dynamic range to be able to, to hear these satellites. I'm wondering how much it improved when you're able to do like a USRP or a more, uh, mm -hmm. more professional frequency hardware. Question is how much improvement was there from an, going from an RTL SDR to a like more professional grade SDR? And what I can say about that is that at the moment we're not using a professional grade SDR at, at all. Um, So we were using the radio batch in, in Munich, and it's a formidable radium receiver, really. Um, you are more interested in the antenna, in fact. So this is a modified GPS antenna with the GPS filter removed and iridium filter inserted, and also the patch antenna changed to an iridium one. And this is the most important part of the system. It's not so much how much dynamic range does your receiver have, it's more how good is your antenna. So this thing has 8-bit ADCs also, just as the RTL SDR has. And we've tried with a Blade RF, which has, I think, a 12-bit ADC. And it didn't give us really significant improvements. So that's what I can say about that. All right, thank you. Happy hacking. Right.